Hello, my name is Rhonda Dickman. I'm a registered nurse and clinical quality improvement specialist with the Tennessee Hospital Association. I lead THA's efforts to support hospitals in reducing sepsis mortality. And I'll be talking with you today about sepsis two and sepsis three, what those terms mean, how they're different, and their implications for hospitals and clinicians. Currently, there is not a diagnostic test for sepsis and sepsis can mimic other health conditions so providers must look for a combination of clinical findings to identify and diagnose sepsis. And international experts have worked to develop consensus on those clinical findings so that anywhere in the world, when we talk about sepsis, we have a common understanding. The first consensus conference was held in 1991 with conclusions published in 1992. The consensus group defined sepsis as a systemic inflammatory response to an infection. And they defined three categories of sepsis. Uncomplicated sepsis, which is known or suspected infection, plus two or more SIRS. Severe sepsis, which was sepsis with signs of organ failure or an elevation in serum lactate greater than four. And then septic shock, which was severe sepsis plus a persistent hypotension following fluid resuscitation. In 2001, the second consensus conference was held and their conclusions published in 2003. The definition and criteria from this conference are what we refer to as sepsis two. The consensus was the sepsis definition was to remain the same, a systemic inflammatory response to infection and the three categories of sepsis also remained the same with some expansion and fine tuning of the criteria for each category. At that same time, the Society for Critical Care Medicine and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine collaborated to establish the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. It was the role of the campaign to publish guidelines develop sepsis treatment bundles and provide education offerings and resources to help in this international standardization of sepsis definition and treatment. And I mention this because in October 2015, CMS adopted sepsis two criteria and the surviving sepsis campaign sepsis bundles for the SEP1 core measure. In 2016, everything changed. There was a third consensus conference and the definition of sepsis was changed significantly. It is now defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to infection. The categories of sepsis were also changed. So now instead of three categories, there are two, with sepsis being defined as a known or suspected infection plus an increase in SOFA score greater than two or outside of the ICU, a Q SOFA score of two or three. And septic shock not only being the vasopressor requirement in light of persistent hypotension following fluid resuscitation, there also must now be an elevation in lactate. When you compare the definition side by side, you can see how significantly they differ. Um, of course, in sepsis three, there is not a SERS component since we're not looking at inflammation. And so it's not until we cross that line into organ dysfunction that we see sepsis now being identified and defined. And again, this difference in sepsis shock, not just being this persistent hypotension that requires vasopressors, but now also having to have that in partnership with an elevation in lactate. So why the change? There had been some concern that SERS criteria had inadequate specificity, that people with a normal physiologic response to infection could demonstrate SERS, and that SERS also could be present in non-infectious inflammatory states, such as pancreatitis or with trauma or burns, post-surgery, et cetera. But the biggest rationale was that the definition was moving away from an understanding of sepsis as an inflammatory response. And so they were saying evidence has shown both pro and anti-inflammatory responses are activated in sepsis. 
treatment that targeted the inflammatory response has not proven to be successful in sepsis. And additional mechanisms have been identified in cellular and organ dysfunction. However, even among clinicians and researchers who agree that sepsis is something more than an inflammatory response, there is controversy over sepsis-3. Some dislike the use of the SOFA score, stating that it has limitations outside of the ICU and is a mortality predictor, not a diagnostic tool. There are others who state the new criteria are based on a retrospective review of data that was for a different purpose and is therefore incomplete or misleading. There are some who are concerned about the neglect of an early pre-organ dysfunction category for sepsis um, with concern that a delay in identification and treatment would result in patient harm or even death. There's controversy since the Infectious Diseases Society of America does not endorse sepsis-3, and I've cited their position paper here for you in case you would like to review that. There has been no change in the ICD-10 codes for sepsis, and probably the biggest point of controversy is that CMS continues to use sepsis-2 criteria for the SEP-1 core measures. In fact, they have um, the leader of their medical advisory group has defended that point of view in editorials in JAMA. And in the fiscal year 2021 IPPS final rule, they will continue to use sepsis-2 for 2021 core measures, and it appears they will continue to do so through 2023. Other payers, though, have adopted sepsis-3, claiming that it is the latest science, and this is leading to claim downgrades and denials when documentation is more aligned towards sepsis-2 criteria than sepsis-3. And whether or not this truly is the latest science for sepsis is being actively argued in literature. I've put just a handful of articles here for you in case you're interested in reading more about this on um, just this controversy between SIRS and SOFA between um, these two different definitions of sepsis. So what are the implications? Sepsis-3 significantly changes the sepsis population. So all sepsis-related metrics tracked by a hospital or clinician will change significantly, be they financial, core measure related, or patient outcome related. Because CMS continues to use sepsis-2 for core measures, clinicians are contending with differing criteria for diagnosis, treatment, and documentation, which is a very frustrating position to be in. And many, if not most, electronic health record systems that provide that continuous background screening for sepsis are still predominantly SERS-based. New research in the field is using sepsis-3 criteria to identify the sepsis population, and there's concern that by excluding the pre-organ failure population of patients, there will be lost knowledge that could improve our understanding of sepsis in the future. And it's generally thought that sepsis is progressive and early treatment is key to optimal patient outcomes. Therefore, in sepsis-3, since the identification doesn't begin until organ failure is present, patients could um, have a delay that contributes to poorer outcomes. So how have hospitals responded? They've raised the concern with Tennessee Hospital Association and American Hospital Association who are aware of this issue and are actively advocating for hospitals. They have maintained systems for sepsis screening and early treatment and are tracking patient outcomes just to ensure that there are no gaps in care. Some have developed consensus on sepsis documentation among their providers so that they reduce variation. And this is done hand in hand with strengthening the overall documentation quality to aid in the accuracy of coding and avoid claim downgrades and denials. They continue to monitor what is happening in this field and some are participating in bringing new evidence to the field, which is greatly needed. So in summary, sepsis-2 and sepsis-3 refer to published consensus definitions for sepsis. Sepsis-3 is a significant change from sepsis-2, both in concept and criteria for diagnosing sepsis. Sepsis-3 is controversial. 
and standardizing and improving quality of documentation is the leading hospital response.